Hello and welcome to Home Worship this week. It's really great to be worshipping together with you. This week we're beginning a brand new sermon series, Stepping Out with Jesus, and we're going to be looking at what it looks like to walk with Jesus as his disciple. In a moment, I'm going to pray to begin, then I'll read our Bible reading and share a message with you. And after a time of prayer, I'm going to hand over to you to make this worship time your own. You can choose some of your own worship songs and play them on your CD player, if you've got one of those, on your piano, on your computer, on YouTube or Spotify or wherever you would like to find some worship music. I also want to encourage you to spend some time reflecting. I've got some reflection questions. You can do a little bit of journaling or maybe talk to someone that you love. And then when you're ready, you can close with the Lord's Prayer. So let's begin. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that when you come to find me, I was not perfect. I was not holy or pure. And I didn't have all the knowledge of a biblical scholar. But you came to call me into your family because you love me. I am so happy that you have called me to come and live with you. You are my hope. You are my Lord and my Saviour. Amen. Our Bible reading for this week is from Luke chapter 5 beginning at verse 1. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, that's the Sea of Galilee, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signalled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. What are you here for? Why are you sitting here listening to me? Why do you pray? Why do you have a Bible on your shelf at home? Well, let me tell you why. It's because you're a disciple. We're not just church members. We're not just people that like to get together and sing songs. We are not just people who read the Bible. We're not just people who believe in Jesus. We're not just people who subscribe to the Lutheran confessions. We're not just people who love to try to live good lives. We are disciples who live with Jesus and he lives in us. When Jesus comes into your life, he calls you to follow him. Not to follow a set of rules. We don't set, follow a set of rules. We follow Jesus. He doesn't call us to follow some principles that he's laid out for living a good life. We live with Jesus. We are disciples of Jesus. And every day he calls you to live in his love and to learn from him. That's what being a disciple is. One of my favorite disciples, if we're allowed to have favorite disciples, has got to be Simon Peter. He is so bold and he always just steps out without even thinking. And sometimes he puts his foot in it, doesn't he? But what I also love about Simon is that he just gets up again and he gives it another go. He's so gung-ho and he's just, he knows Jesus loves him 
and he's going to just keep trying. I love that about Peter. You know, when Jesus came into Peter's life, he changed everything. In fact, he even changed his name. Originally, his name was Simon, and Jesus gave him a new name, Peter, which means rock, Petros. When that happens, on that day when Jesus came into his life, Peter was out on the shore mending his fishing nets because he was a fisherman. He was cleaning and mending their nets. They were getting ready to pack them up. You know, they'd been out all night. They'd done the night shift out on the waters and they were disappointed because they hadn't caught anything. All they wanted to do was pack up the nets and get the boats ready so they could go home and have probably some food and have a rest. But Jesus asked Peter if he can use his boat as a speaking platform. See, there was this great crowd following Jesus and they were pressing in on him. And so Jesus got on the boat and they moved the boat a little way out. And so Jesus was up there and he could easily speak to the people. When he'd finished speaking to the crowds and dismissed them, he turned to Peter and he said, Peter, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Now, you can imagine what Peter is thinking at this point. He's thinking, we were up all night and we didn't catch anything. He's thinking, Jesus, you are a carpenter. I'm a fisherman. What do you know about fishing? He's thinking, I just cleaned the nets. You know, I just want to go home and have a rest. But Peter doesn't say any of those things. Listen to what he says to Jesus. Master, We've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. Because you say so. It's because of who Jesus is that Peter will do it. You know, if some random dude was walking along the sand on the beach and said, Hey, fisherman, why don't you put your nets out again? I dare say Peter's response would have been a little bit different. He might have even used some specific fisherman's type words to speak to that man. But because Jesus asked him, Peter will do it. Because Peter loves Jesus. Peter respects Jesus and he trusts him. Otherwise, he simply wouldn't be doing this. So they go out, they put down their nets again. And what happens? They are so full of fish that the nets are beginning to break and they call over another boat and they eventually get the the fish into the boats and the both of the boats are so full that they're beginning to sink. This is incredible. After a whole night of not catching anything, all of a sudden they catch everything. Incredible. And Peter is just so overwhelmed. Take notice of this, brothers and sisters. When we do what Jesus asks us to do, look what happens. Even when he asks us to do something that doesn't make any sense, if we just say to him, because you say so, Jesus, I will do it. Look what happens. And what happens? Peter is just so completely overwhelmed. He's witnessed this amazing miracle and he says, go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinner. He falls down on his knees before Jesus and he just says please go away from me I'm not worthy to be in the boat with you see Peter recognizes in this moment that Jesus is the Lord it's one thing to watch Jesus perform miracles for other people it's one thing to hear that Jesus has been doing amazing things you know healing the sick and turning water into wine and doing all of these amazing things but when Jesus performs a miracle for you it's different And this was a miracle that was just for Peter and for his friends. This was a a fisherman's miracle, surely. And so Peter knows in this moment that he's, he's standing there in the boat with the Lord. And he also knows that he's not worthy to be there. He doesn't deserve to be there. In fact, he shouldn't be there because he's not holy. He's not perfect. He... But this is what makes Peter the perfect disciple. This is exactly what Jesus is looking for. He's not looking for people who are biblical scholars. He's not looking for people who live a holy, perfect life or think that they do. He's looking for disciples who are humble and who trust him. 
Take notice, friends. This is what the prerequisites of a disciple is. Humility and trust in Jesus. If you want to live with God, if you want to follow Jesus, the only prerequisites are that you admit and and humble yourself before God and admit that you're a sinner and trust him. And so Jesus takes Peter and he calls him to follow him. I love what Jesus says to him. Jesus says to Simon, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. What beautiful words to hear from Jesus. Jesus accepts you just as you are. He loves you and he wants to bring you his grace and forgiveness. He wants to help you and heal you. You know, he's not expecting you to make something of your life he, or get yourself in order. In fact, these things will happen anyway. As we follow Jesus, his grace and his love change us. It transforms us. Not, not because we have to and we, we, I mean, we want to. We want to be changed by Jesus. But what actually changes us is his love, his grace and his word as he speaks into our lives. And it happens almost without us realizing. And it does take a little while. We can get a bit impatient with ourselves sometimes. And we want to be changed. But Jesus is patient with us. And we see this in the disciples as well. I love looking at the way Jesus works in the life of the disciples. Because as I see how patient he is with them, I realize he can be patient with me too. And slowly. You know, this is how it begins. First you start to believe in Jesus. Then you start to trust him. And then all of a sudden you look back on your life and you realize you're a different person. Your priorities are changing. You, your life looks different. This is what grace does. It changes us. What happens next in the story is what I think is the most surprising thing yet. So it says in verse 11... They pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. Peter and some of his friends left behind their boats. They left behind the lake that they knew so well. They left behind all of those fish still sitting in the boats. I mean, that's got to be a lot of money's worth of fish. They left it. The perfect catch. The best catch they'd probably ever had in their life. And they left it. They left their families behind. They left everything that was their safety and security. Everything that they were comfortable with. And they went with Jesus into the unknown. Do you understand now why I think this is the most surprising thing in the story? Because people don't like to leave their comfort zones. We don't like to leave what's familiar to us and what's safe for us. But when Jesus asks you to go with him. When he says, come and follow me, we can do it because he says so. Because it's him. We can leave. And sometimes he will ask us to leave what is comfortable for us. He will lead us into dangerous places, unknown places, scary places even. But we can go with him because we know that we can trust him. And it's worth it. You know, Peter, he thought it was absolutely worth it. And I'm telling you, it is. When we go with Jesus, he has all the answers to every question. He can heal us. He can help us. He can lead us into a freedom like we've never known before. When you walk with Jesus, you'll find yourself discovering wonderful, amazing things that you can't find anywhere else. And on top of it, our Lord Jesus has a love and a grace, a forgiveness that is never ending. So this is what discipleship means. Discipleship is living with Jesus. Not rules, no tests, no religious standards. Jesus just says, come and follow me and live with me. Doesn't mean coming to church and learning about God. It means living with God. 
Maybe let me give you an example. Why do, do you need to go on an apprenticeship if you want to learn a trade? I mean, you can go to trade school, you can go to TAFE and learn all about how to build a house, but no, you need to go and spend time with a builder because you're going to learn things there that you can't learn in a book. Or if you want to get your degree, quite often it involves work placements because there are things that you need to learn out in the real world. You need to see what it looks like to do what it is that you're studying. Uh, you know, even, even those that don't have a lot of work experience built into their, um, their training, you're going to learn those things when you get out in the real world. I had, um, I had nine months of vicarage when I was studying to be a pastor, but even then that didn't really quite prepare me for what it's like to actually be a pastor to a congregation. I remember the first year when I was out of seminary, the first year after I'd been ordained, I learned just as much from that church community and with that church community as I did every year of my, my seminary training. It was, I learned just as much as what I did in the classrooms. And I, I learned just as much in the second year too. And you know, more than 10 years later, I'm still learning. I'm learning from my congregation members. I'm learning from other pastors, mentors. I'm learning in the real world. You know, this is the wonderful thing about the Christian faith is we don't just have a set of rules to get us to Nirvana or to get us to heaven. We have a God who came down to help us. And this is the only religion, the only religion where we have Jesus, where we have someone who came into our lives to help us. All of the other, all of the other religions, they don't, they don't get that. We have a God who loves us, who came to help us, to forgive us, to heal us, and to lead us. And this is not just true in the New Testament. You might think, oh, in the Old Testament, they lived by the rules. And then in the New Testament, we have Jesus. Well, no, if you look at the Old Testament, you'll see God was with them just as much as Jesus is with us in the New Testament and beyond. You know, there's this moment when God rescued his people from slavery in Egypt. He just brought them out of Egypt and led them into the wilderness. And there he gave them the Ten Commandments inscribed on tablets of stone. Um, but then the people angered God so much that he said, Moses, you take them and get out of here. I cannot live with these people. They make me so angry. If I come with you, I'm going to kill them. And Moses says, no, God, we can't go without you. If you don't come with us, we're not going anywhere. See, they needed more than just rules to follow. They needed more than just being set free. They needed a God who would live with them and teach them what it means to be a new people. They needed a God to protect them and love them and guide them. And Moses convinced God. I think God wanted to be convinced. But Moses convinced God. And God went with them and he guided those people through the wilderness in the form of a, a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire, if you remember the story. See, God has always been there for us. He loves us. He wants to bring his grace and his love and forgiveness into our lives and help us if we will just humble ourselves like Peter and trust him. So, over the next few weeks, we're going to be unpacking our church's mission statement, which is step out with Jesus to help others. It's a really great mission statement, um, and it's not new. In fact, I think it's been around for longer than I've been a pastor. But when I look at this mission statement, I think they're such beautiful, simple words. Step out with Jesus to help others. So even if you're not a member of our church here at the Ark in Salisbury, I, I, I think you're really going to enjoy coming along on this journey as we look at what it looks like to be a disciple of Jesus, what it looks like to be church, stepping out with Jesus and helping others. And I really wanted to start this study before I get into the words of the mission statement. I wanted to start here talking about discipleship because I think this is really important and this is foundational for everything that's going to come next. We are not just members of a club. We're not just people who like to come together to sing. We are disciples 
of Jesus. I want to encourage you to continue the discipline of giving your offering to God at this time. Uh, whether you're a member of our church, you can give uh, with the details that are up on the screen. Or if you're a member of another church, you're very welcome to continue giving to your church. It's good for us to give to God because it reminds us that he is the one who provides for us and that he will continue to provide for us. Um, if you are a member of our church, I, I want to thank you for continuing to support us in our ministry. The money that you give is used so that we can care for you and for others in our community and reach out with the love of Jesus all around this world. Now let's take some time to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we will praise you all the days of our lives with new songs and old songs. You are good and you care for us with unfailing love and faithfulness. Please be with your church all over the world as we begin to consider when and how we can return to large worship gatherings. Bless our pastors, worship leaders and volunteers. Give us patience, kindness and flexibility. Above all, Lord, make your presence known because we're here to worship you. In our homes and in our church facilities, you are with us and that is what is most precious. We pray for our church community here at the Ark in Salisbury as we begin our old church Bible study. Help us as we explore what it means to follow Jesus together. Please give us a fresh revelation of Jesus that we may know him and live in his love and grace. We also think of those who don't know Jesus. Those who have never had the chance to hear about him and those who know of him but don't really know him. Please reach out to them, Jesus. May we be your voice in this world and your loving presence in our community. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. So now I'm going to hand over to you and I want to encourage you to finish this time of worship by singing some songs. I've got a couple of suggestions. Maybe you'd like to sing What a Wonderful Name by Hillsong Worship. You might like to sing Our God by Chris Tomlin or Amazing Grace. There's lots of different versions of Amazing Grace, but you can even find it in your hymnal. It's um, hymn number 851. You might also like to spend a little bit of time in reflection. I've got a couple of questions for you. Uh, what part of our reading this week stands out to you? Our reading is from Luke chapter 5 verses 1 to 11. What part of that stood out to you this week? Second question, have you ever had a night of fishing when you didn't catch anything? What was that like? And thirdly, how do you think Peter was feeling as things progressed for him in this story? It's really interesting to kind of follow this story and look at it through Peter's eyes. So I'll leave the rest of worship up to you. Take your time and then when you're ready, you can close with the Lord's Prayer. So great to worship with you and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Peace.